Hello everyone, this is Law for Community Workers on the Go, a podcast for community and health workers. My name is Bridget Barker and I work in the Community Legal Education Branch at Legal Aid New South Wales. I want to begin by acknowledging this recording was made on the land of the Widjibal Wyabal people of the Bundjalung Nation and on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to Elders past and present. I also pay my respects to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people listening to this podcast. This is Episode 8 in our series Renting Matters, the final episode in this series. Episode 8 focuses on tenants facing additional barriers in the renting market. This episode is the first of two parts. In Part 1, we speak to two international students, Sanjaya and Chaitra, about their experiences in the renting market. Most of the houses that I have lived are all shared accommodation. And I have lived about nine to ten houses so far. As an international student, it was very hard for me to find a stable and um, affordable house at that point. And during those times, the pandemic happened. So it was very hard to find a good housing at that point. And when you're talking about uh, housing problems, yes, there were housing problems with uh, regards to bonds, tenancy issues, tenants. And also, uh, I had to move a lot of houses because of jobs uh, where I was doing because sometimes it used to be far from where I live. And in particular, the difficulties they faced during the first phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I personally have had a challenging experience trying to find decent accommodation to live in Sydney. When I came here as an international student in 2018, It was not easy to find decent, affordable accommodation in one of the most expensive cities in the world. When uh, the pandemic hit, there were no moratorium on evictions that had taken shape. And we did not know whether we could stay in the accommodation because um, I was told not to come uh, to my job until further notice. And that is when I had to reach out to every single person I knew. And fortunately, our own community people stood up for us. And I was able to live rent free at a friend's place for about three months until I got back on my feet. In part two of episode eight, we speak to Justin, Assistant Principal Solicitor at Marrickville Legal Centre, about a client he helped who had been facing discrimination and vilification in their community housing. We will also speak to Cathy, a senior advocate at Side by Side Advocacy, a service that supports people with disability with a wide range of issues, including in their housing situation. We acknowledge that there are other people and groups in the community who face additional barriers in accessing and maintaining stable housing. We have interviewed a selection of people to highlight the difficulties faced by many. I would like to welcome Sanjaya to the podcast today. Sanjaya is an international student who has kindly agreed to speak with me today about his experiences in Australia related to housing. Sanjayo, would you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Hello, namaste everyone. My name is Sanjay Sharma from Nepal. Um, I'm a recent graduate in Master of Social Work uh, in Australia. Currently, I'm working in the Smith family as a family partnership coordinator and a community organiser. Thank you. How have you managed to negotiate the pandemic and what were your experiences during the pandemic as an international student in Australia? So first thing, obviously, um, I lost a job. Uh, Well, not technically lost a job in a way because I was a casual worker. So like they stated that you are still a casual worker. It's just that we don't have work during those times. That's what they stated. But I was never called back to work. And with regards to that, um, I didn't have a lot of pocket money safe at that point because a lot of went to the tuition fees. So during those times, I had challenges not getting any new jobs. 
because there were not a lot of jobs available during those times. And during the first pandemic phase, I didn't have a lot of money, which also resulted um, in uh, postponing my education. And also, it also almost led me to be um, homeless. However, during those times, I was living with a family who were from Nepal. So they were very generous. And they stated that you don't have to pay any rents uh, if you don't have any money during these times. You can pay us later when you have it. So I didn't have a job. Um, I was not studying at that time. However, uh, with uh, home and groceries, the families helped me. And with the groceries and other, st- uh, other financial help, um, I reached out to a few organizations. And uh, Sydney Community Forum was one of those who supported me to reach out to different organizations at that point, um, which uh, they had a program for international student OIS. They referred me to Red Cross, Salvation Armies, where I could probably get a financial aid. So during those times, um, I had problems with jobs, rent and financial problem. When you were able to gain work again, did you continue to live with the family or did you look for another kind of housing? So I did look for another kind of housing during those times. However, I could not move houses at that point because I had uh, borrowed a few monies from the people I were living in. So I could not leave the houses even if I wanted to. And with jobs, um, I was not able to receive uh, a job at that point. I-, I had kept looking for jobs. It's just that I couldn't find a job that was suitable for me or that was uh, able to say yes to the jobs because they were like, uh, we're not open at the moment. So I received only after when the first lockdown was over and it was kind of back to normal. And I received a job when my friend said, hey, there is a position open in my uh, bar. Would you like to come? And I said, yes. And he helped me to get that job. So afterwards, um, I started doing jobs, uh, paying my rent. During the initial phase of the pandemic, did you have any access to government support from the Australian government? No, there were not any benefits that were provided by the government because I still vividly remember um, Scott Morris saying saying that you can go home if you want to. However, um, we were not able to go home because um, there was no flights that were being taken over there to go back to our country. So there were a lot of reasons, even if we wanted to go back to our home country, we couldn't. And yes, there were no kind of government support in the beginning of the first pandemic. So all the things I was able to manage, uh, finance support or any form of support was through community organizations or through a great cause of salvation. Those were the kind of the only um, organizations I got support from, not any government support. I imagine too, you and your family would have invested a lot to get you to Australia and, and enroll in your course. It's not a simple matter of just going home, as well as the fact that there were no flights from Australia for you to be able to get. Yeah, the country I come from, um, so if you, even if you talk about uh, exchange rate, uh, is very high because like one rupees back in nepal so one dollar over here is almost like 90 rupees back in home so it's a lot of money from where Mm. i come from so we are heavily invested so for that we take educational loan back in nepal with a high interest um because of lack of securities and everything because the bank they will only provide if you have high interest rate so it's very hard because the governance is not very good as compared to australia so the interest are very high so it's not uh, easy for us to secure a stable life over there and even in financial way so we are heavily invested by our families and there is a high interest rate over there. I understand since you've been living in share housing that you've experienced some problems. Would you please tell me about some of the problems that you've had and whether you have been able to solve those problems? Most of the houses that I have lived are all shared accommodation. And I have lived about nine to ten houses so far. Uh, not all of the problem were fixed. As an international student, it was very hard for me to find a stable and um, affordable house at that point. And 
during those times the pandemic happened so it was very hard to find a good housing at that point and when you're talking about uh housing problems yes there were housing problems with uh regards to bonds tenancy issues tenants and also uh I had to move a lot of houses because of jobs uh, where I was doing because sometimes it used to be far from where I live. So those was one of the reasons. And um, not long ago, I came across a challenge, a problem. So I just recently moved to this house uh, in Paramata. So it hadn't been a month. So we almost came together at the same point. So in our house, we don't have gas. However, we received a gas bill. So we were not aware that we don't have a gas. We thought that the all the gas was for the hot sour. And we received a gas bill and it was for 27 days. And that cost us almost like 300 something. And we're shocked to receive that at the amount seeing that because normally it wouldn't, that is like for a three months bill. So we're shocked. We had a conversation with our attend and he said that you don't have any gas at home and we're shocked to hear that we don't have gas and we receive a gas bill. So we had a conversation with the retailers. They said, uh, we don't know what happened, but there is a gas bill on your name and this is what we know. We can't uh, have any information further about this. So you have to talk to your distributor or your agent and all that. So we talked to all of the stakeholders, but however, all of the stakeholders Holders used to say that have conversation with your retailer or distributor. They used to blame someone else. So like we were tired of what they were saying because we have a problem. That's why we came to you. We're not trying to reach other people and say like, okay, you have a problem, go to someone else. Because we're trying to come up with a solution and we're always trying to put the blames on someone else. So there was nothing we could do with the retailer and distributor. Then we went to our agent because he's the one... uh, who has the information of all those things. And then we stated to him that, okay, either you solve the problem or we'll leave the houses. Even we know that we have heavily invested uh, with bonds and furniture and all that. We're ready to give up because like we are not able to pay this kind of uh, incomprehensible amount of money every month. As international students, it's very hard for us to pay that much of amount. So we said that either you solve it or we leave the houses. And then uh, after a couple of days, uh, we received an email that is stated that okay, you don't have gas at home and this shouldn't have come to anything. So we provided uh, the evidence that was provided to us by the agent and we talked to the uh, retailers and all. That. So the retailers said, okay, we'll look into the matters. Uh, I believe we had a problem. So he said that I'll look into it, we'll solve it. So the problem was resolved. However, in a funny way, the retailer said, the retailer or the distributor said that, okay, if you want, we can join the gas bills too. And we're like, why do we need a gas bill if we don't have a gas? <laughs> yes. So we're like, we don't need any gas uh, f- uh, bills or retailers to be connected in ours. We don't want it. We don't need it. So it was a funny thing of him to say it because it's very irrational and illogical. During those times, we had com- had a conversation with friends uh, how to have this conversation uh, with the retailers because one of my friends also had similar issues uh, in their past days. And they said that, okay, go to the fair trade ombudsman uh, and file a complaint. They will help you if there is any sort of those problems and all that. So we do it all of those things uh, that our friend came across and how they resolve it. So we try to do all of the things that were suggested to us. And also during those times, I had received a training from SCF. Uh, so we had a confidence enough to have conversation with our retailers, distributor, is to stand firm and say, okay, we're not taking this uh, sort of uh, bullshit from you. So we're taking um, our stand firm and we're not paying any penny. So that was a kind of good thing that came out of those training because we're confident enough to have conversation with all of the stakeholders and resolve the issues. Sounded like you had to do a lot of hard work in order to resolve an issue for a bill for a service that you don't even receive. Yeah, that's a funny thing. (laughs) Um, So initially, 
were you aware of any services like fair trading that could help you with your housing problems or was it really just through friends who'd had that experience and knew about them that you found out about those sorts of organizations i knew there was like a union or trade something that will help us but i i wasn't aware of the specific one so uh, i knew my friend had come across similar challenge so i had called my friend and asked him like we came up with this guy i know you had a similar problem and he was like no we had the same problem and we did this and and he said like go to the fair trade ombudsman and we're like okay i'll take your suggestion and we also did that we filed a complaint just to be on the safe side that if something happens tomorrow that we had did everything right by the rules yes yeah so we tried everything we could to get out of the trouble This podcast is aimed at community workers who often help people with different sorts of problems, including tenancy and housing problems. And I wondered if from your experiences, you might have suggestions or tips for community workers about how they could support international students. I'm not sure it will be a suggestion in particular or not. However, um, I believe that... um, maybe workshops training um, would probably help it and also reaching out especially to the colleges i believe because normally and i guess we try and try to include communities but the international students are hardly in those communities because we have a lot of things going on in our life and we don't tend to participate on those sessions but if you reach directly to the colleges, you'll find all of the people over there, the international student, I believe. So I'm not sure how we can connect uh, the community worker and the international student from that community because I believe almost 90% of the people don't even have that time to get connected with community organizations or to ask help because they have a lot of challenges in their life going on. So they don't yes. think about this frequently. So it sounds <laughs> like services need to actively reach out to places where international students are living or studying to make them aware that they can get different sorts of help. Yes, and that's what I would say because for as me, I have to go to work, I have to go to study in college, right? So you'll find me there anyhow. But if you are talking about come to my program or something, I would say I don't have a time because I don't find it necessary for me to attend, even though I know that it's going to be helpful for me. I don't have that much of a time to yes. give to our organizations, come there for an hour, because that would be like, okay, I'm losing, what, $20, $25 per an hour. So I would probably invest my time where I would be working. Yeah. So that's how my mindset work, And the friends I have known, that's how their mindset work too. So there isn't an incentive for us to come over there. We know that it's a good thing, but we don't have any reasons or incentive to come with it. What about online help? Would that be an easier way for you to access help if you could send an email or use a chat function? Would that be better for international students? I suppose yes, because um, we are a lot of international students, or me, myself, are very into gadgets and technologies. However, that will depend entirely upon how it is marketed and how it is used. Because for me, it doesn't necessarily mean I will be accessing or using those. Because I might not be aware of the facilities that you are providing. For example, I know there are a lot of services, right? It's not that people are not aware that there are services. Either they don't look it for, or they are just not aware where to look it. I think that's where the problem arises. Thank you for that. Is there anything else you wanted to add about your experiences to do with housing as an international student? For me, personally, I would say like uh, finding an affordable and stable place has been a challenge for me. Like I said, I have moved around nine to ten times. So that's not even a three years so far. So that's like moving three to four times per year <laughs> because international student has a lot of uh, challenges and we don't have working rights as a full-timer so mm. we don't earn a lot of money and our tuition fees are comparatively very high compared to the domestic students right so 
with regards to that, affordable and stable accommodation would be a very highly recommended suggestion from my side because if that's a thing where we can afford and can live uh, in one place for a longer period of time, I think that saves a lot of money because it's yes. very expensive. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sanjaya, thank you so much for uh, participating in the podcast and I hope that um, your housing experiences are better from now on. Hopefully. I do hope that and hopefully not just for me but for the people who are international students that will be resolved in some ways too. And yes, thank you for inviting me to this podcast. I'm very pleased to be joined on the podcast today by Chaitra. Chaitra is an international student and she works for the Sydney Community Forum as a project officer. Chaitra, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Thanks, Bridget. Hi, everyone. My name is Chaitra and I am from India, from a place called Bangalore, which is in the south part of India. And I came to Australia in 2018 as an international student to pursue my master's degree uh, from UNSW. And I've graduated during the pandemic without a graduation. But Mm. since then, I have been working at Sydney Community Forum, which is an NGO that started to organize to help international students during the pandemic and along with uh, a coalition of organizations uh, including the Sydney Alliance. So we received a grant from the City of Sydney project and since then I've been organizing international students community and we are the very first hub in New South Wales. It should have existed long before but uh, fortunately the pandemic made this happen. So it's a blessing in disguise, I would say, that uh, there is Mm. an international student hub in Sydney uh, catering to the needs of international students in New South Wales. So Chaitra, what has been your experience and those of other international students that you've met through the forum since the start of the pandemic? So I personally have had a challenging experience trying to find decent accommodation to live in Sydney. When I came here as an international student in 2018, it was not easy to find decent, affordable accommodation in one of the most expensive cities in the world. And although I did apply to get into university accommodation, the rent there was absolutely not affordable it was almost 400 or 500 dollars a week and so I had to resort to looking at other accommodations closer to the university and so five of my friends along with me tried to look for an accommodation and we came across this uh, apartment in Bondi Junction that was advertised on Facebook and we started chatting to the landlord and we weren't aware of the systems and what a bond consisted of, how the process would look like uh, once we start renting the place. And we did all the due diligence from our end to ensure that the bond conditions were correct and We signed the lease agreement as well and trusting that the landlord would register in the rental bond board and that did not happen and we started to realize that once we were given one week notice to move out of the property uh, even before the lease period ended. And that was my very first challenge that I faced as an international student trying to find affordable, safe accommodation in Sydney. And fortunately, we had access to lawyers through my university and uh, we reached out for help. And from there, I think we were advised that, you know, this is the next step. Nobody requires you to move out because as students, these are things you don't know when you come here. What are your rights as a tenant? And the fear is very visceral uh, in the sense that you aren't sure uh, and and also there's this constant 
threat from landlords that if you don't listen to us, we will report you to the migration and we will get you deported. And these were things that were told to us. And these are things that we have to go through. And there's a lot of fear that's induced constantly. Given we are on temporary visa, we have to go through this. And our response was, okay, is that even possible? And so when we reached out to the lawyer, the lawyer said, that is not how this works. And these are your rights. And this is what you can do. And so we had to file and go to the tribunal to ensure that we received our bond money back because the landlord was just not ready to give our bond money back. And we had paid around $3,600, which is a lot of money for us. So I'm already paying $90,000 to do my master's degree. That Aside from that, I'm supposed to manage paying high rents in Sydney, afford food and groceries, travel expenses, and everything else. And that's a lot of money for an international student to be able to afford here. And there's no way you can live in peace with all of this stress that's so pressing at times. And on top of that, if you have people asking you to leave an accommodation that you're comfortable at and that they won't pay you your bond money back. We then reached out to the tribunal and registered a complaint against the landlord that they're not giving us the bond money back. Some of the things that don't come to mind are, you know, what are the possible clauses that the landlord and the tenant needs to know? Like, what are, what about wear and tear of some of the things in the property? And so finally, we had to speak in front of a judge and the judge was fair and we got most of our bond money back not all of it though more than what we had offered during the mediation process so that was a big relief it sounds like a a very positive outcome for you but it was very fortunate you had access to a lawyer otherwise you wouldn't have known about what your rights were in that situation yes and just learning about your rights is part solution to this big persisting problem and the most predominant and persisting problem for most international students is whether or not they will receive their bond money after a stay and this has been one of the most common cases that I have come across at my work organizing the international students community as well and some of the challenges is what if you don't have a lease signed lease agreement before you request for your bond money back or how does a lease look like what does an agreement look like and what does it entail what are your rights there and most of the times the only place that international students can afford is a shared accommodation through either flatmates.com or gumtree so you're most of the time subletting without knowing that um, you're on a sublet accommodation So what are the rules that entail subletting and how do you identify what your rights are there and how can you claim your bond money back? There is a lot of lack of awareness in the community specifically because you've never rented before ever in your life and you've come here to start your life from scratch and you have to understand the entire system and structure overnight, which is impossible. So you walk through this process and the system here does not make it easy for us to be able to access those rights. And whether there exists a tenants union that is in favor or at least that you can reach out for support to at any any point in time that you're going through an a challenge or an issue. So these are things that we need to spread the word across in the community through migrant leaders, through migrant community services. And it's a very pressing issue and ongoing one as well. Thank you for that. What about financial struggles during the pandemic? Did you experience those as well? Yeah, just like my peers, honestly, when I think about the pandemic, I don't know where the two years have gone by. So it wasn't easy, just like every other international student for me as well. When uh, the pandemic hit, there were no moratorium on evictions that had 
taken shape and we did not know whether we could stay in the accommodation because um, I was told not to come uh, to my job until further notice because the store wasn't opening. I used to work as a casual employee at David Jones and I did not know the entire situation was so uncertain and nothing was planned whether or not I should go home. What about border closures? Flights were incredibly ridiculously expensive and that was not affordable at all and uh, parental anxiety constantly asking and checking whether I'm okay although I had to calm them down so all of this surfaced uh, and it became so real that I did not know what to do so I spoke to my agent during the pandemic and I said I'm not able to afford the rent so what do I do and the response from the agent was, if you cannot pay your rent, you'll have to leave the place. So it was as simple as that. And really, where where in the world would I even think of going? Because this is a place where I've met people. I did not have friends and family when I came here. And who do I reach for support or help was a big question mark. And that is when I had to reach out to every single person I knew. And fortunately, our own community people stood up for us. And I was able to live rent free at a friend's place for about three months until I got back on my feet. And that is when we started campaigning for the International Students Crisis Accommodation with the New South Wales government in 2020. And that was a successful campaign, fortunately, and I was able to apply and I was one of the beneficiaries of that temporary crisis accommodation that was offered. And that was a big, big relief because back then inspections had become impossible because we did not know how this novel virus was spreading and nobody wanted to risk coming and inspecting in person. Yes. Or even I did not know whether I had to go and inspect. And there was complete uncertainty. I will surely say that international students were completely left out of the loop until the crisis accommodation scheme was rolled out. So after that period and you needed to look for other accommodation, how do you look for accommodation? You mentioned flatmates and dot com and Gumtree. Is that how most international students find housing? Yeah. So when we come here to find accommodation, there are two things that uh, we look at. One is whether the place is furnished and most of the furnished places are shared accommodations and whether it's an unfurnished lease that you sign on and you furnish it on your own. So most of the times it's the previous choice uh, that we make because we cannot afford to furnish and pay the rent. Um, Mm. So that's the initial go-to for us. And the only way that we find out about a shared accommodation is either through social media platforms like Facebook or Gumtree or Flatmates. And these platforms don't necessarily inform you about your rights as a tenant and you don't even know what this entire deal works like and sometimes it honestly works on implicit trust with somebody and that uh, the landlord trusts you that you will pay your rent and there's hardly ever a lease agreement that's official there so I think it's quite unregulated in that sense, if you look at it. And there needs to be more regulation to how subletting works in Sydney, because all or most of international students that I I come across usually sublet. So they're in particularly vulnerable situations. Absolutely. And it's only when they're in the most dire need of help is when they start looking at resources and services that is affordable and accessible to them. And that is when they contact, you know, uh, the Tenants Union or Sydney Community Forum or services that, uh, or migrant uh, legal services that 
because there are very few services that offer support to temporary visa holders and that's what happens and th- that's exactly what i did during uh, my situation in the first few months in sydney where i started looking for who is here for us and who do i reach out to the and and the only point of contact that you have when you come here is your university or your education agent so your entire situation you're relying on them to have your back and i think it's really important that the providers education providers and agents work towards how it is important to bring awareness for the international students community on their rights in australia work rights accommodation rights uh, what is accessible to them what are the support services available to them and this has to be done in the first few months as they arrive and i think that's going to make a world of difference they're very good suggestions chatra i thought i'd ask you about any other problems that international students have experienced through your work at the forum that you might be aware of i think you know a safe place to rent where as an individual you're in a safe space to live is also equally important because what sort of rights you have as a tenant because safety is a big concern for international students when they come here mm. and not just for the students but also for their family back home to know that their children who've moved and started their lives in Australia are safe here and especially for women who come here alone to pursue their studies it's important for them to know that they are safe and most of the time in countries like India or Nepal or Bangladesh there is this requisite of sorts that if you are a female and you move to australia you might as well get married because you have a man to keep you safe and mm. that is how important safety is for people and especially women who come here and a lot of the students have shared with me that they have rented or lived in places they where they felt unsafe uh where they were not sure about who they were living with what they were doing here and and not everyone they share with our international students and so there is a level of anxiety that kicks in when the space that you're living in which you call your home isn't safe to live in so that's another significantly important problem that i have heard of and i think it's really important that the community of international students is accepted and australians and international students try to connect more and bridge the gap that exists right now because that is making people feel welcome and offering a level of support and knowing that they are living in a just land that they also have rights as tax paying citizens of this country they're very important points that you make would you have any tips or advice for community workers who might be trying to help international students with their housing problems or other problems that they face yeah i think the main recommendation or suggestion that i would have is for communities that are established to work with migrant communities it's really important to understand the cultural significance and nuances that exists within the community and no matter what an indian would go to an indian uh, when they need help and a nepali would go to a nepali when they need help and that that becomes more or less implicit within the community and it's really important for established australian communities to understand the diverse and cultural differences and work with migrants to help them understand that there is support available and that we can work together to make this a better australia for all of us and not just you or me so i think that's my biggest and strongest recommendation 
Thank you, Chaitra, and thank you so much for sharing your experiences through your work and your personal experiences with me on the podcast today. Thank you for having me, Bridget. That's all for part one of episode eight. Please look out for part two of episode eight, the final episode in the Renting Matters series, which will be out soon. Thanks for joining us.